love to do this with all just the voices. You ready, Jesse? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And we are in the life of David, part two. Uh, today, 2 Samuel, um, 2 Samuel, where are we at? 16, 17, 18, 19? And uh, I'm going to be completely honest with you for a second. As I'm looking here at my notes, I printed out week five of Life of David, part two. We are on week seven. But I'll have you know that this weekend, my wife has not been home. She has been on a retreat with the women, many of you men. Congratulations for being here today. Uh, you were left alone or left alone with your kids. She has been on a retreat with the women of Depot. And uh, I have four boys. And so, uh, I'll just be honest with you, my mind has not been in a great place this last few days. And so, here I am opening my book, ready to preach on... Uh, the Life of David, Part 2, in 2 Samuel 17 through 19, I think, today. And all I have before me is five. So thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> love each of you. Uh, Jesus loves you. Uh, go in peace. No, uh, I will try to remember. I, that's one thing about me is um, I don't have a really good memory. And so, uh, I don't, and so <laughs> what I have to do is, there's different styles of preaching, okay? I have seen guys that will take a note card and put just one word in pencil, and they will preach an hour from those one word, right? That ain't me. I, I cannot do that. And so, in seminary, I learned um, the concept of, Basically, it's you write word for word what you're going to preach. And so that's what I do because my memory, I, I write word for word what I'm going to bring on Sunday. And it's in manuscript is what it's called, manuscript form. And so I open my book and there's the manuscript. And so as I preach, I have it in front of me and I, I read through it. And uh, so that's just, just how I have always preached, how I've learned to preach. God bless those men who are just able to write an outline and, and just go with it, that ain't me. So I apologize, but I am going to try to, to highlight uh, a couple areas that I might be able to remember and recall from my sermon. As we read through 2 Samuel 17, and you can turn there with me, 2 Samuel <clears throat> Second Samuel 17 through 19 is where we're going to be today. And this is a, a story within the grand story of David's life. So, you know, we've been studying the story of David for a while now, but this is just a story within a story about David's son, Absalom, usurping David's throne. And now David is on the run again. Early on in his life, he spent a lot of times hiding in caves and, and running from King Saul. But now, he has already been king. He has united Israel under his banner as king. Uh, Jerusalem is the city of David. And now, his own son, Absalom, is usurped his throne, uh, caused a revolt, taken over the city. And now, David, we find on the run again, hiding from his own son. 
In verses 8, uh, se uh, chapter 17 through 19, I will just share with you kind of what happens. There's this guy named Ahithophel, and he is now Absalom's advisor. You see, he was King David's advisor, but uh, he stayed for the king, not for the person. And so he is Absalom's advisor. And Absalom, what he wants to do is he wants to take 12,000 men and he wants to uh, find David, who was in, on the run, and his men, and he wants to kill David. Nobody else, just David. And so he brings this idea, Absalom brings this idea to Ahithophel, which is uh, king, uh, his advisor, once King David's advisor. And, and so they decide... Uh, that they would move forward, but Absalom says, wait, let's get some advice from Hushai, which is another one of King David's advisors who happens to be back in Jerusalem and not with David. And so, they, so Absalom goes to him for advice. Is this a good idea? Should we send 12,000 men after the hiding uh, and running David? And so um, Hushai says, no, it's not a good idea. You don't need just 12,000 men. You need everybody. Like, you need every, every able-bodied man in Israel that is on your side to go and get David. Now, now, David is on the run, yes. And they may be somewhat disappointed, but look, these are seasoned warriors, David and his men. They know how to fight. David knows how to lead people in battle. And... They know how to run and hide. And so 12,000 men ain't going to cut it. So take everybody. Take everybody because these guys are like a dog in a corner. They're backed in a corner and they're going to come out fighting. I think back to like the Revolutionary War where we were outmanned, outnumbered. I know I sound like the musical ha uh, Hamilton. I can't remember everything today. Hamilton. Y'all gotta help me, help me. Uh, Hamilton, outmanned, outnumbered, outgunned, right, by the British. But yet there was fight in the dog uh, through the revolutionaries here in America. And this is the same thing. They have a fight in them to get the kingdom back. All right? So, he re uh, so Hashai recommends that Absalom not just send 12,000 men, but as many able-bodied men as possible. But Hashai has a, an agenda here. He sends uh, two of the priests to David to warn him about what's getting ready to happen. Hashai has kind of just taken what Absalom and uh, his other advisor had and said, hey, uh, I'm going to direct it the way I want to do it, and you're going to... Um, I'm going to warn David. And so they warn David about what is about to happen so that he can prepare. Now, David gets prepared. He, and we're, in, we're in 18 now, 2 Samuel 18. David prepares his men. He gets his men together who are with him. He has his generals. He, he groups them in three different sec, uh, group troops, uh, and they are ready for war. And David says something interesting because in the past we've seen David, uh, when he got in trouble with Bathsheba, remember he should have been leading them in battle, but he got in trouble instead and stayed back. But um, here we see that he wants to lead his men into battle. But his men say, no, you, you can't do this. You must not go because you're the reason we're fighting. You're, you to be king again is the reason that we are fighting. And so if they get you, then there's nothing else. That nothing else matters. It's all going to be your son Absalom's again. And so David reluctantly obeys with his leaders and goes with what they say. So he sits at the gates and waits to hear word as they go into battle. So this battle begins in this forest, and 20,000 men give their life in battle as it rages. It also says that more men gave their life because of the forest, uh, not necessarily the sword, which reminds me of some war ideas like the Civil War, where uh, men were dying just because of diseases, right, and, and conditions. That happens a lot in war, and it tells us that here as well. Now, 
during the battle, Absalom happened to come upon some of David's men. And when he sees them, he tries to run and escape on his mule. And as he is escaping on his mule, we, we talked about before how he um, had some wonderful hair, right? And, uh, not, uh, and um, it weighed five pounds, his hair. Well, he was, while he was fleeing on his mule, believe it or not, and this is where I believe the Bible to be true because fact is crazier than fiction, right? And this is where I believe the Bible to be true because this happens. He rode beneath the branches of this tree and his hair gets caught in the tree. And so the mule keeps going, and he's dangling from the thicket of the branches in the tree. He's just dangling there for anybody, any person, to uh, take the sword and kill him. I was, um, I joked last week because he talked about five-pound hair, and I know mine is getting there. Um, I've had many questions about it. I will cut it, I promise. It's getting hotter, I'll cut it. Uh, but I, I, I'm feeling really good about it, and so I'm letting it... Um, uh, <laughs> My wife likes it, and so, you know, it's going to stay for a little bit. And last week when we talked about the five-pound hair, and, and I, I jokingly, you know, did that, and I did it again today. But listen, seriously, when I read about this story again, and, and I was studying it this week and reminded about it, Wednesday I got on the, tr the, the, the mower to mow, and I had, I know you're not supposed to do this, but I had my son with me on my lap, okay? Judge me later. And we were mowing, and you guys know what I'm talking about. We came around a tree, and it was real close to tree limbs, right? And as, and, and when you go, you, when you're driving around the tree and you're trimming, what do you do? Your response is like to, to push the limbs up, to get them out of your way. And it immediately reminded me with my bushy hair um, about this and how this happened with Absalom, and he was dangling from this great tree. So there's the guys that were chasing him come upon him, and he's just dangling there with his hair, ready to be killed, but they don't kill him. They go back to Joab, the general, and they say, hey, we, have got, we, we saw this happen. You're not going to believe this. We saw this happen, and Absalom is dangling from, a, dangling from a tree. Why didn't you kill him? Well, they remember what David said. David said, believe it or not, uh, Please be kind to my son Absalom. All right? That's what David said earlier on. Please be kind to my son Absalom. But Joab goes out with the men, and as he's dangling there, Joab uh, stabs him three times, and then he has some of his men finish off the job. How, it doesn't really specifically tell us how, but he uh, has them finish the job on Absalom. And so Absalom is dead, and uh, David's son is dead. The current self-anointed king of Israel is dead, and all of his men flee. They run. I want to stop there for a second and just talk about pride. You know, there's scripture that says, pride cometh before the fall, right? Right? And we're actually seeing this in this story play out. Literally, the one thing that Absalom was known for scripturally was his wonderful head of hair, all five pounds of it. And here it is, the thing he was prideful about and people saw in him grabbed him up and left him in a precarious place to be killed. Pride cometh before the fall. This is what happens with Absalom. It also happens with us in many, many situations. Now, it's okay to be proud of accomplishments. It's okay to be proud of things you do but the problem comes when that proud turns to pride. And what happens in that transition from just proud of an accomplishment to pride is that your accomplishments become all that you are. Everything 
to you. Being proud, we can say, hey, I'm proud of what I did. I give God the glory for how he is working in my life. Pride is different. Pride is set in to the soul and the spirit. Pride sets in and it becomes all that you are. It takes over. And it's no longer about God. I accomplished this or that because of God, not because of myself. Pride becomes, I did this on my own. I did this for me. Pride can be a problem in our lives, and it will come before the fall of our lives. There's something to be said about us seeking to be humble Christians. having some true humility in our lives. There's something to be said about humble Christianity, and humble Christianity is this. Whatever I do, whatever I accomplish, whatever I have going on is not because of me, but because of Jesus. And I give him all the glory for what he does in my life. There's another thing, too, I want you to know, and that is this. Let someone else be your cheerleader. All right? Follow me here. This will help with pride. Let someone else be your cheerleader. If you're accomplishing things and doing good things in your life, that is wonderful. But let your spouse, uh, let your friend, uh, let someone else, your boss, let them announce and proclaim what you're doing and be your cheerleader. Because what happens if we become our own cheerleader, then we can easily hop into being pride and, it, and letting it set in in our lives. So let other people uh, cheer for you and say, and then, guess what? You humbly say, no, 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 it's all God. It's all God. To him be the glory. To him be the glory. As we move on in 18, we see that David mourns Absalom's death. And, and that's fine. That is expected, right? He has lost his son, and, and we know the many different layers of how he lost his son. It started back when um, his other son, uh, raped Tamar, which is Absalom's sister, and there was just hate and anger because David did nothing, and so there's many layers here. And so in the later part of 2 Samuel 18, David mourns his son Absalom. He mourns so much that he's crying and weeping, overcome with emotion. It says this, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son, if only I had died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, my son. As we move to 19, his trusted general Joab has to step in and rebuke David because of his mourning. Joab finds out how he's crying and mourning and, and, and as we just read, a gut-wrenching. He's ran away to a private place to mourn the death of his son. So Joab, his trusted general, has to come in and rebuke him. Has to tell him to stop because what he's doing is he is mourning his loss of his son over the victory of his men. And so what they're seeing, his men are seeing that what they did, they're feeling bad about what they did, that they brought victory, that they regained his kingdom for him. And Joab is saying, hey, you're making your men feel really bad about themselves, like as if they should have lost the battle because of the way you are mourning. And so Joab tells David this. He rebukes him and says, now you go back to the gate where you were sitting during the battle. And you meet with every single person that fought for you 
to get the kingdom back. And you celebrate with them because you're acting like you wish we would have lost. And guess what? If Absalom would have won, it would have been all over for you and your men and your women and your families. So he says, here's a good rebuke, buddy. You're going to celebrate. You're not going to mourn in front of everybody. And so David takes it. He receives that rebuke, and that's exactly what he does. He goes to the gate. He sits there, and every single person that fought in this battle came by. And instead of mourning, he celebrated with them. I'll stop right there for a second, because to me, when I read this, it sounds a lot like sin in our lives. Hear me out. A lot of times we can mourn our sin being gone over the victory that Jesus has given us through sin. We miss the sin more than we love the victory that Jesus has given over sin. Y'all, y'all get that? You understand that? He was mourning the loss over the victory. And we do the same thing in our own life. Whatever sinful lifestyle or sin that is that we have uh, been forgiven of and repented of and turned the other way, we mourn the loss of it rather than celebrate the victory in Jesus over it. Be careful, Christian. Be careful, church. And you know what? It's okay to rebuke some folks. I know it seems hard, difficult to go face to face with somebody and say, look, you ain't living it right. But you know what? In the long run, What is best for them is for you to speak up and rebuke some folks. David, King David, the King David of the Old Testament was rebuked by his general and he took it. He received it. And so it's okay to be rebuked and it's okay to rebuke people. Now, you got to be careful not to point them to their sin and say, ah, you shouldn't have done that. You know, there's a way to do it. And it's not pointing them to their sin. It's pointing them to Jesus, who has the victory over their sin. You're forgetting about this. You're forgetting about Jesus, and you're looking at this. But now look, friend. You got to look to Jesus in the victory. David received it too. In his place, he could have. Punched Joab in the eye. I don't know. He could have said, no, sir, I will mourn. But he knew, and often we do too when we're in sin and and we're hanging on to sin and we're grasping at it and mourning the loss over it. We, We do too. We know we're doing it, right? We know it's wrong. We know we're doing it. And so when somebody comes in and says, hey, friend, no, 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 no. You can't do that. Then we should humbly say, you're right. Humbly receive the rebuke. Humbly take the rebuke. As we move on to 2 Samuel 19. As we come to the end, David returns to Jerusalem. David returns to Jerusalem. All of Absalom's people that were following him, they have fleed, they are in hiding. And David returns to the city of David with his men to be king again. But something interesting happens along the way. As he is returning to Jerusalem with his men, there are two people, particularly, that he comes in contact with that he met as he was leaving. When he was kicked out of town, so to speak, and on the run, he ran into a guy named Shammai, and Shammai didn't like him. He was in the house of Saul. He didn't like him too much. 
I believe he threw rocks at him, cursed at him, told him he was a killer. And so on his way out of town, that happened. And he also uh, met with Mahistabeth, right, which was David's grandson, who was trying to go to Jerusalem and start Saul's, uh, excuse me, Saul's grandson, who was trying to start Saul's kingdom over again. So on David's way out on the run from his son Absalom, he meets these two folks, and they don't treat him so well. On the way back into Jerusalem to get his kingdom again, he meets them again. This time, things have changed, right? Shemaiah greets him, and again, David has every opportunity to cut him down where he stands because of the way he treated him on the way out. But he doesn't. He shows him mercy. Thing, same thing with Mephibosheth. Saul's grandson, he, he wasn't even at the house when David came out because he was already going back to Jerusalem to try to take over. But on the way back, David sees him, and it says he shows some kindness. Something I learned growing up, I hope you did too. Be careful how you treat people on your way up because you're probably going to meet them again on your way down. Heard that before? David shows us this. And be careful how you treat the people on your way out. Remember, he could have had them chopped down then because you're going to meet them on your way back in. We must be careful how we treat people when God gives us opportunities to be on the up, what I would mean on the up, okay? In your business, you're working with some folks, right? Same level, you get a promotion. Now you're the boss. Be careful how you treat those that you were just with. Because just like that, you can be back with them. Be careful how you treat people on the way up because you could meet them on the way back down. And this is a great illustration of that for our lives. David shows kindness to people who were not kind to him, mercy to people who did not show him mercy when he was on the run. As we end 19, we see that David enters back into Jerusalem But it's not over. I wish you could say he could, I wish I could say that he took back his kingdom and, and all is well again with Israel. But next Sunday when we turn the page, we're going to see there's another uprising. Another uprising in the life of David and, and trying to take David's kingdom. Another revolt. And if you remember from past messages... All this in that low valley on the map of David's life is because of sin with Bathsheba at the top of his life. This is all what God said would happen because of what he did in disobedience. There it is. And we're at the very lowest of lows right now. These are all consequences of disobedience and sin. Okay? I'm going to close with some prayer. If you would all bow in prayer with me. Father God, I thank you for this study in the life of David. I thank you for the lessons we have learned from his life that we can apply to ours. So God, may we do that. May the words we read and the things we learn from the life of David actually speak to us and change us. 
Because we know that the life of David points to your son, Jesus. That generations and generations after David comes, Jesus. Not the Savior of the physical Jerusalem and, and people of Israel, but the Savior of our sins. Not by <laughs> battle, but by giving his life for us, we are saved. So, Father, as we study the Bible, not just in the life of David and First and Second Samuel, but throughout the Bible, may we look for Jesus in all of it, because he is there. And so, God, I pray this morning that if there is someone here who has not received Jesus as their Savior, today would be the day Their life changed through the forgiveness of their sins and eternal life awaiting them. And God, for every single person here today, as we stand and as we sing, God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would move in us and challenge us to live a life that is more worthy of our calling to be your children. We love you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And as we stand and sing, sing speak to us, God. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.